If you will, please open your Bibles to the book of Genesis and uh, chapter chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And uh, you can find your place there. It shouldn't be too difficult. If you don't know this, Genesis means beginning. And that's the beginning of your Bible is actually Genesis. So it should be pretty easy to find. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are plenty of Bibles available. Uh, there be in the chair racks or uh, maybe just sitting out on the seat close to you. They would be the black, the black volume or black book. Uh, there rather than supposed to the blue one, which is a hymnal. And uh, we want you to have a copy of the scripture because that is a distinctive of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. One of the things that we must not get away from is the, the knowledge or the uh, remembering who we are, what our identity is as a church. And our identity is really quoted up on the uh, on the picture over here on the wall, I guess that's what you call it, on the verse, Psalm 138, 2. And uh, God says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And to really, if God holds his word, the Bible, in such high esteem, then we also hold, uh, ought to hold God's word. If something's important to God, it ought to make sense that it'd be important to us, or it ought to follow, shouldn't it, logically, that it would be important to us. And God holds his word in very, very high esteem. Uh, God's Word is a perfect book. It's a perfect book. If you have not read the Bible, uh, if you've only read what people have said about the Bible and have not examined it yourself, you may not know that it's a perfect book. But if you'll put it under the examination, you'll take the time, invest the time to read this book, you'll see, first of all, it's a divine book. That is, it's, it's not just another book. I was uh, reading some statistics on literature last week, and I was looking at uh, some stats on ancient texts. And there are some ancient Greek writers. I want to say one of them would be, oh no, some guy whose name I can't remember, but he's known in the literacy or in the literature world. Uh, I wish I could remember his name. I can't think of it. Who? No. Would have been, would have been, no, would have been like 5th uh, century. Like, uh, no, you know what? No, not even 5th century. It might have been like 1st century. It would have been a contemporary of the apostles. I'm trying to think who it would be. No. no. He's later. He was a historian, not so much a literature. Anyway, what I was going to say about it, here's, let me just make my point. Uh, some folks have said that they have, of ancient copies of those scriptures, that they have something like, uh, if they have a lot of copies of that author, they would have something like 15 would be a massive amount of uh, written existing uh, fragments or manuscripts. And uh, but if you compare that with the Word of God, I saw I saw an illustration the other day of how much, like you know, up to the fifth century ancient manuscripts there are left, and it was something like. Uh, uh, four empire state buildings. If you stack them all on top of each other, four and a half empire state buildings of ancient manuscripts of the scripture, copies, not, not complete scriptures, but fragments of the Word of God. If you stacked them on top of each other, there would be four and a half empire state buildings wow. high. Uh, I think it would have been, I can't remember how many miles it would be into the sky. I think it's, um, what's the empire state building? Like uh, 11. Thousand? No, the Empire State Building is like twelve hundred feet. Maybe. Yeah, so yeah. So eleven hundred something, together, less than twelve hundred. It would still be quite. It would still be about about a mile slightly. Yeah, it'd be about a mile high if you were to stack up those fragments, and that and that is pretty substantial when you're talking about handwritten ancient manuscripts, the majority of which have been destroyed. That there would be that much remaining. My point is, the Bible is a prolific book. Uh, it was. It's been much thought of, much revered. It, it doesn't make any sense at all to copy out something to that degree, to that extent, if it's not the Word of God. It's a divine book. And it's changed lives. It's been changing lives for years and years and years. And I'll uh, challenge you to examine it, the Word of God, for yourself. If you don't know it's the Word of God, examine it. And look at the things that are uh, that its accusers say about it, and then look at the accusers, the people that would say it's not the Word of God. Look at them, look at their motives, look at what's behind what they say, and then examine their arguments against it. And you'll find, when you examine their arguments against the Word of God, that 
their, their arguments are fallacious and the Word of God isn't. It's infallible. And so uh, this book is amazing and that's one of the distinctives of our church is that we believe the Bible is the Word of God and we hold this book up. And so you don't have to wonder when you come here whether or not it was just going to be you know, an order or a religion, a group of people that believe certain things. Uh, we we want to teach what the Word of God says. And I'll be first to tell you that if we discover that something that we're teaching in our ministry contradicts the Word of God, we're wrong. And we'll adjust what we believe to come under the authority of this book. That's a distinctive of our ministry. Now go to Genesis chapter 3, and I want to read a really interesting uh, verse. Matter of fact, I would like to just go ahead. Well, we'll just read verse 21, and we'll pray and become... Uh, and, and then we'll get into our text tonight. I'll tell you where we're going with it. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. Let's read that again. Verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed, clothed them. So Father, please help us tonight as we look at this covering that you made for Adam and for Eve, and help us to be able to draw the conclusions from the picture that we see here that Jesus Christ is the covering for us. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. <clears throat> you know the story, don't you? What happened in the garden where original sin came from? We have some small copies of the Scriptures that we hand out that don't have the whole Bible in them, but we have them both in English and in French and in Spanish. And those copies of the Scripture are Genesis chapters 1 through 3, and they also contain the full Gospel of John and the full letter to the church at Rome, the Romans. So we call them Genesis, John, and Romans. They're not the full book of Genesis, but they are Genesis 1 through 3. And some folks have asked the question, why do we include Genesis in, in like a, a, a portion of the Scripture that we would be giving out primarily so people could know and understand the Gospel? In other words, John's Gospel helps people to know the good news about who Jesus is and how they can personally know Him as their Savior, how they can personalize what God has done in giving Jesus uh, to die for us on the cross for our sin. Okay, Now, we include Genesis 1-3 through 3 for a reason, and the reason is just practically this. I have found that there are a lot of people, we just, we just aren't in a biblically literate or even uh, church literate day and age. I've met a lot of people. Uh, it used to be when you ask people if you read the Bible, most people at least lied to you about it. You know what I'm talking about? Have you read the Bible? Yes, I've read the Bible. How many times? Oh, a lot of times. And then you start to ask them, well, could you say your books of the Bible? Could you tell me what books are in the Bible? Oh, uh, well, uh, you know, they can't go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. They don't even know the books of the Bible. You don't have to have read the Bible to know the books of the Bible. That's pretty elementary. Uh, but when you mention a book of the Bible, they look at you like a deer in the headlights because they never read that book. You can ask them about uh, Hezekiah or any of the unknown books of the Bible, and they wouldn't even know you're making a joke because Hezekiah isn't in the Bible. It just sounds like it belongs in the Bible. And uh, they wouldn't know that. Uh, you could tell them, ask them, well, tell me about Ezekiel, or tell me what you think about Lamentations, or about uh, some of the uh, minor prophets like Hosea or Joel, or what, what do you think about the material in Zechariah? And they wouldn't have a clue about that. I've had some people tell me that I've read the Bible, I don't believe it's the Word of God, and I don't believe there's a God. And I tell them, well, you know, if you've read the Bible, you know what Romans 1 says about you. Now, they don't know what Romans 1 says about them because they haven't read the Bible. And uh, the Romans 1 says there's no such thing as a, as a person who doesn't believe there's a God. See, if they were to read it, they'd know that, but they've never read it. They're not being honest about it. And uh, so we include Genesis 1 through 3 because most people... Uh, really don't even know who God is. They don't know where the world came from. And most people do know that the world has problems. But they don't know why the world has problems. Genesis 1-3 through 3 really gives us origins. How the world was made. How man was made. And then where sin came from. Where did the world's problems come from? And Genesis 1-3 through 3 tells us about the fall of man. Most of you know about this. You know about Adam and Eve in the garden and the willful decision that Adam made to sin, to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he thought it would make him like God. That was the lie that the serpent told. 
but I actually didn't make him like God. It just gave him the ability to know good and evil. And the knowledge of evil, of course, gave him the knowledge that he was a sinner. And Adam sinned. And sin, the Bible says, because Adam sinned, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, I'm going to answer a couple of simple questions this evening that you maybe have asked, or maybe haven't asked, uh, or maybe you've asked and answered already, but I think everybody fits in one of those categories tonight. But I think if these questions are relevant to all of us. And the question is, first of all, uh, first of all, why was the covering of fig leaves that Adam and Eve made not sufficient? In other words, look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. Look at what God did. Uh, or, the Bible says, um, Unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them? That's an interesting thing, isn't it? Remember, Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they saw that they were they their eyes were open, and they saw they were naked, and they hid from God. And then they made garments, clothes. They sewed together fig leaves and covered themselves. And you've seen the pictures, haven't you? The artist rendition, you know like a fig leaf bathing suit or something like that, you know, something barely covering them. I think that, I, I used to think, as a matter of fact, I might have been told this, I'm not sure, but I, I know I used to think that the reason God made garments or clothes out of the skins of animals was because fig leaves just aren't durable. <laughs> I have a nice set in my truck of some really, really nice feeling welding gloves made out of, Anthony, you know what, what kind of leather those welding gloves are made out of? Deer skin? Yeah, they're, they're deer skin. And they're, I mean, they're soft and pliable. They're really, they're $9 for a set of, well, it used to be welding, good welding gloves like $100. Harbor Freight sells them for $9. And I mean, they're comfy and they're nice and they're good quality and all that. Good uh, good welding gloves. And uh, But the nice thing about them is they're, they're durable. I mean, they're made for high, high voltage welding and they're supposed to resist that. They're, this, they're, they're good quality. Um, but I used to think that the reason that God made Adam and Eve clothing out of skins was because fig leaves wouldn't have been good quality. Yes, ma'am? Is it because of the lack of faith that the patience of not allowing, of not having the patience of clothing oneself with cotton, like harvesting it, spinning it, then well, eating it, then sewing it, and then wearing it, maybe? Well, I think that's... The of the animal was yeah. a lack of patience for the harvesting. Well, okay, so there's a lot more work maybe that went into it. Yeah, maybe not, though, because if you think about it, yeah. A lack of faith is impatience. Well, faith is, faith is the answer, but patience isn't necessarily the, the issue. It's, it's the shedding of blood, and we're going to get to that in a minute. It is, it's the picture that's here. But, uh, it, yeah, I'm glad you're thinking because you're following the lines of what we're talking about this evening. It's really important. This is, this is really foundational. Uh, to knowing who God is and, and knowing the answer to it. Okay, so if a guy were to take uh, the cotton plant and render the cotton, you know, take the seeds out of it and twist, you know, spin it together and create thread and then weave it together and take time. But the reality is something you pointed out is that even making clothing out of skins, obviously for God, would not have been as complicated as it would be for us because he would have had the knowledge, but it seems that God really... I mean, God could have said clothing. Right? I mean, if God made the world out of nothing, and if God made the animals out of nothing, and if God, uh, because he made man in his image, created man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the, rip, the breath of life, and if God took a, a rib out of Adam and made Eve not a separate person, but another person... If God could do that, making clothing was as simple as speaking. In other words, if God spoke the world into existence, God could speak clothing into existence, right? What's more complex? The se seven days of creation, one of which God rested, or making clothes for Adam and Eve. He could have spoken, spoken this animal skins one step, but no, I think God did what He did on purpose for an example. In other words, this is not, Genesis 3.21 is not an explanation of how God made clothing. It's a picture of how God covers us. Because that's the point of it. The point of it isn't cotton 
or uh, you know, and, and again, what I was going to say and didn't didn't finish was that the garments that Adam and Eve made out of fig leaves could well have been quality. I'm not sure that Adam and Eve, with their superior uh, knowledge that they had, they certainly would have been created in a much more superior environment to our inferior one today. Believe me, the world has not gotten better uh, from when it was created in its perfection in the garden. They were living in a perfect world. We're living in an imperfect world. So I'm not sure that Adam and Eve could not have extracted the fibers from the fig leaves and have woven some high quality clothing. Is that not possible? I think it is. Matter of fact, they may have. The problem was is there's nothing about that clothing that covered Adam and Eve's sins. The thing they were hiding from God. See, they had their fig leaves on and they were still hiding from God because they were naked. In other words, God's holiness exposed their sin. And really, nakedness is more than just not being clothed nakedness is being in the presence of a holy God and His holiness exposing everything that's unclean about us. That's the picture. Genesis 3.21, the inclusion of this simple verse that says that God took animal skins and made clothing for Adam and Eve is not in the Bible by accident. If you think of all the things that Adam and Eve knew. If you think of all the things that were passed down that Moses, when he wrote the account of creation, knew and could have written that are not included. There's a lot of information that isn't here. But you think of all the things God could have inspired to be part of His eternal Word, verse 21 then gets a lot of significance, doesn't it? It's a significant verse of the Bible. And it's important for us to understand what it is that was the covering. So the Bible says unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Let's get another clue here. Let's go to chapter 4. Adam and Eve had children. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She was looking for the promise of that Redeemer, that Messiah that was in Genesis 3.16 when God said that for the, the, the woman was going to conceive and she's going to have a child who's... Uh, her seed, which is impossible, and by the way, the Holy Spirit knows biology, which is impossible, but that seed is going to bruise the serpent's head as a reference to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The seed comes from a man, but Genesis 3.16 says the seed of a woman. And Jesus Christ was born of a woman without a man because the sin nature is passed by men. And it's a prophecy, the first prophecy in the Bible, right after the original sin, is a prophecy of a Christ redeemer who would be born of a virgin. And so there's a lot that's revealed there in the Scripture. <clears throat> now, verse 2. Abel. And she again buried his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now when Cain was born, Eve said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. When Abel was born, she called his name Abel. <laughs> okay, now think about that. Have you ever noticed this? In other words, this firstborn son was the one that Eve was hoping was the Messiah, would be the Redeemer, and of course he ended up not to be that. If you look at the two sons, Cain and Abel, which one turned out to be a murderer, and which one turned out to love God and get murdered for it? Well, Abel would have been the one that offered the more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and Cain would be the one who rebelled against God and offered his sacrifice. Now let's talk about that sacrifice really quickly. Remember, well, let's read about it, and then we'll talk about it really, as quickly as we can. In verse 3, in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was ticked off. No, it says Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now there's a lot more here than what's included. Right? This is the first murder. And uh, there's a lot more included. In other words, the Bible says Cain talked with Abel his brother. Well, you don't know the conversation, do you? What was the topic of the conversation? 
I think the topic of the conversation was sacrifice. Sacrifices. In other words, when God made a garment of the skin of the animals, God was showing Adam and Eve and mankind the necessity of a sacrifice for sin. That's why a plant without blood did not suffice to cover Adam and Eve. See, it wasn't the skin, the difference between the skin of an animal and cotton or fig clothing. It was the difference between blood being shed and a sacrifice being made for sin. <clears throat> and so Cain tries a stunt, sort of like the contrast between uh, Adam and Eve's attempt at covering and God's attempt at covering. Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with what? Fig leaves. And God clothed them with what? Animals. Animals. Now, you can go and take fig leaves and the fig tree can still live. But if you take the skins of animals, then something has to die. And my friend, because of sin, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's what God's Word says. So because of sin, there has to be death. Why is there death? Because of sin. And if an individual is going to live, there has to be death in this place because God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Whereas either God's true, and His promise is true, and His judgment is right, and God is perfect, or God's a liar. God isn't a liar, is He? And so there had to be death. And so Cain pulled the same stunt his parents pulled. His parents tried to cover themselves with what? Fig leaves. And God gave them what? Animal skins. So now Cain offers, Cain's a tiller of the ground, and Abel is a man who takes, uh, who raises, obviously, animals. And that's the difference in the types of farming that those two brothers did. And so they go to offer God a sacrifice. Now, let me ask you a question. Why sacrifice? Why sacrifice? Yes? Is it the capacity to love God more than to the point of self indifference? Okay, so that would be devotion. But that wouldn't be the purpose of these sacrifices. The reason for these sacrifices is because they're sinners. And they're trying to cover their sin so that they can have a relationship with God. So it's a sin sacrifice that they're offering. And it's a picture. It's a picture of faith. Because if there's supposed to be death, if they sacrifice themselves, they'll be dead. So they're offering a sacrifice, the precedent of which has been set by God, and that is a substitution in animal instead of you. An animal which doesn't have an eternal soul and isn't made in the image of God is offered as a picture of the ultimate sacrifice whom we know as Jesus. And so the, the answer to that question would be, no, that wouldn't be the reason. Why? The reason they're offering sacrifice is they're trying to cover their sins. And Cain tried to offer a sacrifice that didn't require death. See, if death is required for God's wrath to be satisfied for sin, there has to be death. There has to be shedding of blood. And Cain tried to offer a sacrifice without blood. Now, I have been the advocate of Cain. I, you ever stood in Cain's place and tried to defend him? Okay, well, you know, I mean, he's a tiller of the ground. Somebody's got to grow plants, right? Does somebody need to grow plants? Is that a good thing? Yes. Was Cain's occupation legitimate? Sure. Okay, now my thing is, I've heard this. Have you ever heard this? Well, you know, Cain just gave what he had. And isn't that all God wants from anybody? Just give what you have. So that's the argument, isn't it? It sounds good on the surface, doesn't it? In other words, Cain raised the fruit of the ground. That was what he'd invested the sweat of his brow into. And it, it, when Cain gave the fruit of the ground, it was kind of given of himself to God. Well, well, that'd be kind of like what you're talking about, like giving something from yourself or devotion, a sacrifice of devotion. The problem is, is Cain's sacrifice of devotion ignored his obligation to pay for his sin. He's trying to offer a devotional sacrifice instead of sin. Matter of fact, are there not devotional sacrifices in the Old Testament law that involve 
Not shedding blood? What about the meal offering? Yes, there certainly are, aren't there? There are offerings that are given there, and they're, they're sacrifices of devotion, of love. You don't love God if you're His enemy. And you are God's enemy until blood's been shed on your behalf. You hear me? People want to give God devotional sacrifices, and implied in the sacrifice is the notion that my sin, which is against you, God, which is against your holiness, is no big deal. That needs to be overlooked. Let me do something for you, God. When actually we've done the most insulting thing to God, which is sin against Him. And my friend, you can't give God anything until your sin has been taken care of. You hear me? You can't give God anything until your sin has been covered and taken care of. Now, so what's Cain supposed to do? I mean, he doesn't raise animals. He raises plants. Listen to me. He had a brother that raised animals. Y'all ever heard of the barter system? I mean, come on. Hey, Abel, would you like to trade some plants and some... I, I'll supply you a year's worth of vegetables if you'll give me one of those spotless lambs you've raised. That'd be a good deal for Abel. Could Cain have taken his sacrifice, which would just rot when offered to God, and could he instead have traded it to Abel for a legitimate sacrifice? Listen to me tonight. The fact that Cain did not offer a sacrifice that involved the bloodshed of an animal was because of rebellion, not because of inability. In other words, Cain said, I won't offer that kind of a sacrifice. I don't agree with that. And I'm going to do my thing. My friend, listen to me tonight. Listen to me. You don't tell God. You don't tell God how to do anything. God hasn't wronged you. God hasn't done anything against you. Your sin is against God. And His wrath will be satisfied His way. If the Bible says the wages of sin is death, then it's got to be paid for by death. I want you to see something beautiful in Genesis 3.21. See, that's kind of bad news up to this point, isn't it? But let's look at the beauty of Genesis 3.21. The beauty of Genesis 3.21, as I see it, is that the Bible says the Lord made coats of skins and clothed them. Now, I don't think that Adam and Eve lacked the ability to slay an animal, to harvest its skin, and to make clothing for themselves. They had the ingenuity to manufacture clothing from fig leaves, for crying out loud. And I will be honest with you, I think making clothing from the skin of an animal would probably be far simpler than manufacturing it probably from the fibers of fig leaves. Don't you? Extracting fiber from fig leaves is a far more involved process than skinning an animal, isn't it? Couldn't Adam and Eve have skinned their own animal? Couldn't they have? Couldn't God have said that's improper clothing? I want you to skin an animal, and I want you to make clothes from that. I want you to be covered with the skin of an animal. Couldn't God have said that? Yes, He could have. Folks, isn't that implied in the context? It is, isn't it? There's the idea that Adam and Eve, oh, poor Adam and Eve, they didn't... They, I mean, they tried to make clothes, but, you know, it was kind of caveman technology at the time, and they just couldn't do any better than that. Nonsense! Right. They had superior genetics and DNA to anything alive today. Everyone who's been born, everyone walking on earth today is a descendant of Adam, and every time someone's born, they lose DNA. There's genetic code that's lost every time a person's born. We're not superior to Adam and Eve. They were superior to us. Things aren't getting better. Things are getting worse. You get it? So they could have made clothing, believe you me. And so it is not insignificant that the Lord God made skins for them. Let's look at, uh, if you will, with me, uh, please. Uh, can you go over to Leviticus? Leviticus. And I want to say chapter 17. Let's go to chapter 17 of Leviticus. This is mentioned over and over in the law. But when God gave the law... <clears throat> By the way, the same uh, individual that the Holy Spirit used to pen Genesis is the same one that penned Leviticus, that would be Moses. 
Uh, so Leviticus chapter 17, I want to say it's verse, yes, verse. Uh, let's read verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any man of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. It's always been a big deal for God, the consumption of blood. Now this is a separate topic that we could study at another time, but if you'd like to study it on your own, notice in Acts chapter 15, when the New Testament believers were uh, struggling with whether or not Gentiles should be under the law, the Levitical law, like we see here in Leviticus, and they were told they don't have to keep the law, they were saved by faith, not by the works of the law. Matter of fact, no flesh has ever been justified. No person's ever been made righteous by keeping the law. And this is the law here. But it's interesting that in that discourse that the apostles had at Jerusalem, with Paul and with uh, uh, Barnabas and so forth, that they concluded they don't have to keep the law, but they did say there's some things they should abstain from. Fornication. Don't commit sexual sin. And they were told as well, not only not to, uh, not only to abstain from fornication, they were also told that they weren't supposed to eat blood or things strangled. In other words, even in the age in which we live, which is the church age, in this dispensation... Blood's an important issue. Eating blood is something that God says, don't eat blood. The law was very strict about draining the blood from every animal that died and not consuming the blood because in verse 11, the Bible says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So blood was significant because... It had an atoning. Atoning is a, a blood payment. Pays for something. Pays for sin. Makes up for something. And the Bible says without shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Remission means for it to go away or for it to be taken care of. And so the blood was very significant. The shedding of blood was incredibly significant because God does not forgive sins without shedding of blood. And we don't just shed blood. The law said, if a man shed blood, by man shall his blood be shed. It's a big deal to God. Blood's a big deal to God. I heard people say, you know, you Christians, you talk about blood a lot. You sing songs about blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, what a wonderful song that is. Well, I tell you, blood is significant to God. It's a matter of significance because sin is a big deal. And death is a big consequence for sin. And God's sacrifice for sin, my friend, is big costly and it's important and it required the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ his precious son go to Hebrews chapter 9 in your Bible will you please Hebrews chapter 9 tonight the shedding of blood meant death and Jesus when he shed his blood we know that Jesus was the ultimate that every sacrifice was a picture of the ultimate sacrifice. That is, when an animal was sacrificed to atone for the sin of an individual, it was a picture of Jesus Christ, God's Son, being sacrificed for our sin. That's why a sacrifice had to be perfect. Jesus had to be perfect. And when Jesus was offered as a sacrifice, He had to die. Friend, the significance of the death of Jesus Christ, the implication of the fact that God loved us so much, that He gave His Son as a sacrifice for our sin. I cannot state that truth with enough gravity. I can't state it seriously and with enough seriousness or sobriety to the way that we say it or we talk about it. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross is the most costly thing that the world has ever seen. Nothing has ever cost anyone as much as it cost Jesus to give His perfect life for our sinful one. Nothing has cost God as much as turning His back on His Son who had never sinned and making Him sin for us and allowing His life's blood to be shed for Him to be sacrificed in our place. Sacrifice is a big deal to God. Death is a big deal to God particularly because the ultimate requirement for the forgiveness of our sins was the death of Jesus Christ. It was not an easy matter when an individual would raise with love and care a beautiful lamb 
the, the notion that, you know, in Old Testament times, that these husbandmen were impersonal when they slaughtered their animals, my friend, is, is, is uh, it, it's inconsistent with everything the Bible teaches. Uh, Proverbs, Solomon said in Proverbs, he said that, uh, what kind of a man regardeth not the life of his beast? A uh, What? Wicked man regardeth not the life of his beast. I mean, just if a guy didn't care about animals, if a guy was cruel to animals, he was considered to be wicked. It was a big deal. So it wasn't that, oh, you know what, I'm going to kill that thing. That would be fun to kill that. No, 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 no. Man would have a beautiful lamb. And he'd say, this one is just perfect. I've never seen a more beautiful lamb. He's just he's proportionately perfect. There's not a flaw or a blemish on him. He's perfect. And he would take care of that lamb and he would raise it up and nurture it and protect it. And then he'd sacrifice it. How painful could that be? You think you could protect and nurture and raise a lamb and not get fond of it? The lamb didn't have person. You think it was just, oh, I don't care, I'll just kill it. Oh, not at all. See, the sacrifice of the lamb was really, it was really painful for the person who offered it. I don't know about you, but I don't enjoy killing anything. I do what has to be done, but I don't enjoy it. I don't like it, right? I don't think it's fun to just kill animals. I think people who think it's fun are demented, twisted. They're sick people. There's something wrong with a person that just kills for fun. But killing an animal isn't anything like the sinless Son of God dying for us. It just gives us it gives us a sense of the gravity, of the weight of the matter, how important the situation is and how serious it is. If you have to raise a lamb and then once a year offer it, you don't want to do that. And it helps you understand my sin's a big deal. My sin's a big deal to God and it should be a big deal to me. Because something has to die. And today we don't have to offer sacrifices because Jesus offered a once-for-all sacrifice. Are you in Hebrews chapter 9? Let's read a couple of things. First of all, let's read about the necessity of death. In verse 16, the Bible says, Where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay? A testament here would be a will. We would understand the last will or testament of a person. And... and <laughs> My Aunt Margie's in heaven now. She used to be my illustration of this. If you didn't... <laughs> my Aunt Margie, she, she's the one who lived to be 100 and got saved uh, a few weeks before she went to heaven. And uh, <laughs> she wrote a lot of people out of her will. There, she had a couple of... Two favorite... Grand, uh, not, she didn't really have... She didn't have children. Uh, so my mom, who would have been her niece, and really her husband's brother's daughter would have been really the closest to her. Well, there used to be quite a few people. Aunt Margie didn't have much. She had an old house and she lived on a fixed income for like 40 years on a, just a social security income. I mean, just almost nothing. Well, Aunt Margie would give you a dollar on Christmas time and a dollar on your birthday. And I'm telling you, that was a lot of money. Matter of fact, the last year she sent us a dollar, didn't she? And she wrote in her card, this is just kind of sent as a joke to you know, sort of remind you about the way it was when I gave you a dollar when you guys were kids. And I'm telling you something, when I was an adult last year, 39 years old, so, no, 38 years old last time I got a dollar from Aunt Margie. When I got the dollar from her, it meant a lot to me. Because that was a lot of money to Aunt Margie. But she used to write people out of her will. And uh, she'd get mad. My poor cousin. It's her favorite. My cousin, my he, he, was, he was her favorite, and uh, there wasn't anything you'd do to get to be her favorite, not her favorite. He was just her favorite. She always loved him, always talked about him. He never visited her. She wrote him out of her will. Wrote him out. My brother used to go by and mow the grass and all that, and he got put in the will. And then he got taken out of the will or something else. And uh, my mom and dad used to just joke about it. They'd say, you better watch it. You're going to get taken out of Margie's will. And... Uh, I don't think very many people were in her will when, when she finally went to heaven. 
mostly because she outlived everybody in her will. She lived to be 100. But also because she, as long as she was alive, man, you make her mad and you're out. As long as she's alive, that will meant nothing. You can say, well, Margie, you know, you signed it. You, you had a witness that signed it. doesn't mean anything as long as she's alive. She can change it. Look at verse 16 of, of uh, Hebrews chapter 9. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. A will doesn't mean anything until the person who wrote the will is no longer there. Doesn't have any force, doesn't have any authority. And then the Bible says, otherwise it's of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Let's go full circle. We began our message this evening reading Genesis 3, 21, and we looked at the fact that God made skins to clothe, or clothing of skins to cover Adam and Eve. Why? Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Remission's a good word. I've never heard of remission in a bad sense. Have you? Well, you're in remission right now, aren't you? Kind of? Yeah, that's bad. That's great news, isn't it? Remission is what we want. Uh, so you got if you have leukemia or you have cancer and you're in remission? Yes. Yes. If we have sin, there's only one way for remission. Shedding of blood. How many of us have sin? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And my friend, you can play Cain if you want to. You oughtn't to, but you could. And you could say, well, I'll offer this sacrifice, and I don't like to shed blood, so this is going to be my sacrifice of devotion for God, and He should accept it. God says, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Friend, listen to me. And that is not a requirement that God has made which requires man to pay for. It's a requirement God has made which He paid for for the willing death of His own Son. Go to John chapter 10, will you please? We'll finish here. John 10. Look at verse 17, will you please? Jesus is talking about His sheep hearing His voice, but He's also talking about His life and His shedding and giving His life for ours. In verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Verse 18, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. My friend, when they mocked Jesus on the cross, and they said, If you're the Son of God... Come down from the cross. They forgot what Jesus had said. I'm laying my life down. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down on myself that I might take it up again. And my friend, Jesus died. His blood was shed to satisfy the wrath of God. God sacrificed His own Son. Now there are literally scores, if not thousands, of pictures of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. We could talk about Abraham and Isaac and God providing a lamb. We could talk of all kinds of illustrations where God provided for Himself a sacrifice to settle His own wrath against sinful man. And my friend, for God to settle His wrath against you and against I, He gave the sacrifice of His own Son who shed His life's blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. 
every sacrifice that was ever offered was only a picture of the ultimate sacrifice, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. Hear me now, will you please? Such a significant sacrifice ought to be taken and received, not only with gratitude, but it ought to be taken very seriously, oughtn't it? And isn't it foolish for any person to say, I don't need that, or I don't want that, or I don't wish that? Let me remind you of something we said in the beginning. It's God that decides what it is. That's the judgment for sin. And it's God who determines what it is that will satisfy His wrath because of sin. And it is God who sacrificed His own Son to pay for our sin. Is God asking too much for you and I to receive the sacrifice? When He says, As many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Well, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? From sin. Is God asking too much? Pastor, I don't like blood. You know you think God does? Blood requires death. Blood requires a sacrifice. Do you think it was a light matter for God to sacrifice His only Son who pleased Him in every way? No, my friend, it's a serious matter. God's not asking you to like it. He's telling you it's the only way. And yet just as God satisfied His requirement for a covering for Adam and Eve by making them the acceptable covering. God satisfied His requirement for you and me by giving us His own Son for a sacrifice. I don't think I understood all the details of it when I was a child, but I understood it well enough to, to, to take it this way. I understood when I was a child that I was a sinner. And I understood that my sin made it so that God's wrath was against me. And then I understood that Jesus shed His blood on the cross for my sin. And that salvation was freely offered to me. There's nothing I could do that would satisfy God's wrath. Only the shedding of the blood. Only a perfect lamb, only Jesus, could cover my sin. And that salvation was offered as a free gift that I could have simply by asking. And when I was a child, I just prayed a prayer and said, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know Jesus died for my sin. And I want you to save me because of what Jesus did. And my friend, God saved me. He provided Himself a lamb on my behalf. And so I hope that when you read Genesis chapter 3 and you look at that skin covering, I hope you understand what Leviticus 17 says when it says, without the shedding of blood, or the life of the flesh is in the blood. You have to shed blood in order for there to be the death that God requires. And in Christ's blood, a perfect lamb had to be offered in order for God's wrath against us to be satisfied. God's plan was perfect, but my friend, it was not easy. It was not cheap. It required His own sacrifice. What an amazing God. I could never have satisfied the requirements for my sin to be judged and still have a relationship with God. Because if I died for my sin, I would have gotten what I deserved and still be God's enemy. I had just gotten judgment. But Jesus was God's perfect Son and He died undeserving God's judgment. And I got His position, the atonement, the satisfaction of God's requirement for blood to be shed and then Jesus took His life up again. And I live with Him. And my friend, that message is for you. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, you may be religious. You may have done good things, but it's like Cain offering a sacrifice. God says blood's what I require. That sacrifice is just an insult. Bring a blood sacrifice. And then God said, here's the sacrifice I require. I've done it for you. Would you receive it? Would you take See, probably the discussion in the field went like this. <laughs> Bear with me now. I'm, I'm finished. I'm just, I'm just chatting now. Probably the discussion in the field went this way. Cain says, can you believe God didn't accept my sacrifice? And Abel says, yeah, I believe it. God said He wanted a blood sacrifice and you gave Him plants. And 
Cain said, well, I don't even have, I don't even raise animals. What does God expect? And Abel probably said, I'll give you an animal. If you need a set, if you need one, I'll give you one. Cain says, that's not the point. <laughs> Killed Abel. And it was the point. That's hypothetical in my mind, but I think that's the way the discussion went. I think Cain and Abel are having this discussion, and Abel's saying, listen, God said what he required. It isn't that complicated, Cain, just give him what he requires. And Cain says, I shouldn't have to. And Abel says, well, why not? You're a sinner, aren't you? And Abel says, well, my sin's not that big a deal. Really, God should just appreciate what I've done for him. I've heard people say things like that. And Abel says, no, Cain, God should just kill you. And Cain said, I'll kill you. He did. Isn't it fascinating that Cain was unwilling to shed the blood of an animal, but he shed the blood of his own brother? Isn't that something? People go a long way to get around just simply bowing and saying, Yes, God, I'm a sinner. Have enough humility to just say, God, you're perfect and I'm a sinner. God, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. God, will you save me because of what Jesus did? The people will go to hell before they'll do that. As simple as that is, as easy as that is, just to bow before God and acknowledge that sin is what God says it is and that their necessity to satisfy God's requirement is as simple as God says it is. They'll go to hell first. You hear me? I'm not swearing at you tonight. I'm telling you literally what people will do before they'll bow to God. That's foolish. The people that will kill somebody before they'll bow to God. That's foolish. When God's provided His own lamb. God covered Adam and Eve. God provided for Cain and Abel. And God provided for you and me. Isn't that beautiful? God loves you. Jesus died for you. And if you'll receive Him, He'll be your Savior because of His sacrifice. But that requires bowing. Yes, Lord, I am a sinner. Yes, I want Jesus to be my Savior. Father, thank You for what we've learned this evening. And I ask You to Your Holy Spirit to do the work, the, the areas where I'm so insufficient to convey the message and preach Your Word. Lord, I just ask Your Holy Spirit to do that work. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here tonight that does not know Jesus as their Savior, that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, for the rest of us, help us to understand the requirement and the justice of it. Based on your character, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your good attention this evening. I enjoyed that message. I like preaching it probably as much as, probably more than you like hearing it. But uh, some things just thrill my heart, and that's one of them. God bless you. You're dismissed.